Not long ago, Nature Change paid a visit to historic Gates Lodge on the Osabo River. We were there to talk with Marvin Roberson, forest policy specialist for the Sierra Club of Michigan. Roberson is an experienced forest ecologist who advocates for changes in state and federal forest management policies. We asked him to explain the goals Sierra Club has for our public forests. The mission of the Sierra Club is to enjoy, and explore, explore, and protect the natural resources of the planet of this, uh, that we live on. And so one of the things that means for me, because I'm interested in forest and wildlife issues, the Sierra Club works on everything from pollution to environmental justice to all kinds of issues, but I'm interested in forest and wildlife issues primarily. So I try and influence public land management agencies and wildlife management agencies towards a more sustainable, naturally balanced management regime than might otherwise be the case. Well, the state of Michigan has about 19 million acres of forest land. About 4 million of that is national forest owned by the federal government. About 6 million of that is state forest owned by the state government. The rest is a mix of large industrial and small private landowners. But we concentrate primarily on the state and private or state and federal forests because those are owned by the state of Michigan or the federal government. They belong to all of us. We all have an equal right to have influence on how they get managed and so that's what we spend most of our time working on. Whether it's sustainable or not, even if it is sustainable, we're still managing for forests that are wildly out of whack with what natural disturbance would provide for us. As an example, aspen is a particular bugaboo of mine. Under natural disturbance regimes, and when I say natural disturbance regimes, I mean under the disturbances that nature provides for the forest, wind throw, ice, insects, you know, you name it, aspen would be about three to seven percent of Michigan's forests. Because of our forest management history and our current forest management practices, we're at about 35 percent aspen. So that's an order of magnitude above what nature would provide for one particular species. Aspen propagate through their roots, giving them an advantage over other native trees in the early life of a forest. Offering a simplified example, Roberson says that the forests around Grayling before European settlement were mostly mature white pine with a little aspen mixed in. But when the white pine was clear cut during the logging era, the aspen quickly regenerated to take over a larger area. Aspen lives about 60, 70 years. White pine comes up underneath it. Under natural disturbance, the aspen then would fall over and we'd get the white pine back and we'd have the sort of Hartwick pines all over northern lower Michigan. However, if you wait till the aspen gets to be 40 years old and you clear cut the whole thing, instead of the white pine coming back up, you've reset the clock, aspen shows back up again. So we are artificially perpetuating much larger amounts of aspen. And, and I call that early successional forest because that's the early forest that show up after a disturbance. And whether the disturbance again is insects, wind throw or chainsaws, the same thing happens, aspen pops back up. If you recut the aspen at 40 years, you reset the clock, aspen starts again. So we have no, many, no idea how many times you can reset aspen back 40 years and start over again because it doesn't happen in nature. We asked Roberson how his concerns over forest succession might relate to climate change. As I said, we, you know, we cut aspen down at 40 years of age. That means we get 40 years of carbon sequestration before the aspen is turned into something that decomposes faster. You know, chipboard, paper, all the rest of that decomposes faster than logs do. So if we cut the aspen down, that carbon goes back into the atmosphere every 40 years. If we allow later successional stage species to come up underneath the aspen, the aspen fall over and die, these bigger trees sequester carbon for three to 400 years. We're now got 300 years of carbon sequestration we wouldn't have had before. What I'm advocating for, both for climate purposes and for habitat and sustainability purposes, is that we stop regenerating aspen to these astonishing amounts that we are right now and allow later successional older lived species to grow up and sequester carbon. You know, one of the species that sequesters carbon is uh, tsuga, which is hemlock. Hemlocks live to 900 years in the state of Michigan. So that's 20 rotations of aspen cutting that would have gone back into the atmosphere that won't go back into the atmosphere if we allow uh, hemlock to come up. But because of the cutting of the aspen, we're losing hemlock, both because it's displacing hemlock and also because aspen is the first species that buds out in the spring, which allows deer to make it through the winter that wouldn't otherwise because the starving deer eat the aspen buds and then deer eat hemlock. So by growing aspen to provide large numbers of deer, 
we're actually not only displacing hemlock, we're also providing habitat for the species, which is the primary prey predator on hemlock as well. So we are actually not regenerating hemlock almost anywhere in the state of Michigan because we have so many deer. Same with cedar, same thing. They, both of those species come up above the snow, the deer eat them off, so they never regenerate to get 900 years old the way the hemlock can because we've managed for deer which then eat them. So from my perspective, early successional versus late successional management is the single largest forest management issue in the state of Michigan.